it's uh, it's wonderful to to actually have this discussion now. Um, I'm uh, I'm Rudy Bais. I'm the executive dean at Cornerstone Institute, and it's really, really, really my privilege to to facilitate this conversation. Um, so, to the speakers now, welcome you just now. Thank you very much for joining us, especially to uh, Lorenzo David, CEO of Community Chess. He would have facilitated, um, but he's agreed to uh, actually participate as a speaker. Uh, since one of our speakers has been uh, had to apologize at short notice, uh, the executive mayor of, of the city of Cape Town, Alderman Dan Plato, couldn't join us any longer. So, uh, uh, Lorenzo, thank you very much for, for stepping into to the speaker seat. So, um, but uh, to everyone who's joining, um, as you know, Cornerstone on a monthly basis hosts uh, a critical dialogue. We've been doing this for quite some time over the past few years. And the purpose of uh, critical dialogue sessions is to actually open public debate on key issues that, that our society must deal with. Um, uh, key questions, whether they be of an of a economic uh, nature, political, social, uh, uh, spiritual, um, and various themes. Um, and uh, our attempt with that is, is to be a higher education institution that really you know, engages with the world. Um, at Cornerstone, our view is really that if we don't reflect to actually act on the world for change, um, we're not being a higher education institution. So that's our purpose and that's our aim today as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, um, today is, a, is an important discussion in the current context of, of COVID-19, the pandemic. Um, we will be engaging on questions of a global nature. Of course, that if you will, all societies and, and countries and parts of the world must reflect on. And that, of course, uh, is the theme of food security. Um, the reality is that, as in our country around the world, there's increasing concern around food insecurity that, that's presenting, that's emerging, um, that, that societies face, uh, but also continued food insecurity that you know, presumably would, would uh, intensify following the pandemic. Um, and so I think it's an important question for us to ask. And I want to thank um, our critical dialogue team um, who's actually put this whole program together. But let's get into it. Um, I'd like to welcome, uh, of course, as I've briefly introduced uh, Lorenzo Davids, um, a well-known voice in terms of social justice matters in our country, but also more broadly so. Lorenzo, as, as I indicated, is uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Community Chess. And for close to 40 years, and actually had worked in the world of, of, of uh, development and community development and engagement all over the world, quite frankly. Um, and not to go through all the details, but um, uh, uh, Lorenzo is a recognized interna international speaker and thought leader on these, on these themes, uh, regularly, uh, regularly offers the uh, keynotes uh, at the, in the USA and other places as well. If I may brag a bit, Lorenzo, I know you don't like that. Um, has also served on the board of several development agencies uh, in the UK, the USA, Australia, and so forth. Um, but I think what is most critical is that you would see if you would follow Lorenzo on, on, on social media is his direct involvement uh, on community level work, um, working with food parcels. Um, uh, and so, so Lorenzo, thank you very much for participating. You're most welcome. We look forward to, to, to what you bring to the conversation. I also would like to uh, next uh, introduce um, uh, this my uh, Dr. Tulasizwe um, Kabela, who is a group executive uh, for impact and partnerships at the Agricultural Research Council. Uh, doctor, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, it's quite extensive. Uh, how uh, Dr. Mkabela had, had, had led in the field, um, uh, also working as acting CEO of the Agribusiness Development Agency, uh, Chief Operating Officer, Managing Director, um, uh, and Senior Researcher at the National Agricultural Marketing Council, and also then lecturing and Senior Researcher at Stalamos University, again on, on agriculture, and at the UKZN, uh, Good Natal. Um, interesting that, uh, that uh, your, your doctoral research focused on agricultural economics, which of course is an interesting uh, 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 line of inquiry, if you will, um, in the current context where we're trying to save an economy and at the same time I have to ensure that our, that our people have access to, to nutritious uh, uh, food. 
So uh, you're really welcome, and thank you for for joining us and participating in the conversation. I'm uh, looking forward to what you what you bring to the table. Our 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 third panelist uh, uh, um, uh, uh, is uh, uh, Mr. Marius Oosthuizen. He's a member of faculty at the Gordon Institute of Business uh, Science, Gibbs, as we know it, at the University of Pretoria. And he's a strategist. Um, his international work, uh, where he's taught uh, uh, in the US and he's done uh, uh, work locally, he studied in polit political ethics, uh, done work in uh, applied social and political ethics, specialized in strategic foresight, uh, teaches leadership um, at Gibbs. Um, and uh, interestingly, also had actually done, uh, done work in theology. Um, um, so uh, uh, ethics um, and strategy and how they combine and are you actually in, a, in the current context of where the world and uh, our country as part of the world must reflect on how it engages the needs of our people, um, how to lead that environment is a critical one. So thank you very much for joining from that particular angle and we look forward um, to your inputs. Um, so uh, colleagues, as, as we move forward um, in the following way, we'll give each of you an opportunity to make an input. I've asked uh, Lorenzo and uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Tulasi's uh, input to give us a brief overview of what we talk about when we talk about food security as a field. Uh, you know, uh, you know if, if, if you were to introduce a layman such as myself to this area of work, um, in our society, what are we talking about? Um, so, Lorenzo, over to you, and then you know, I'll facilitate that everyone makes an initial input. I'd like to invite everyone who's joining us uh, to please, um, you know, ask questions, make comments uh, 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 on the on the live feed, um, and our our background team will feed your comments to me in the chat box on Zoom, and you know, I'll feed it into the conversation. So, please feel welcome to participate in that fashion. But Lorenzo, over to you, um, and uh, and then to Lassie to make an input as you as you see fit. So, Lorenzo, thank you. Thank you, Rudy. I'm going to take about a two-minute uh, stab at this um, this topic that we're dealing with tonight. It's a it's a it's a global issue that's now um, taking place here in this country. I have said before uh, that um, the food crisis in South Africa has now finally been split wide open. It's like the old veil has been torn and we can now see the stark levels of inequality in this country, uh, where for years we've lived in, in our democracy, warning about the food crisis, warning about the food insecurity, continental wide and in Southern Africa in particular. Uh, and now suddenly we are confronted by, by numbers we've known all along, um, you know, 6.8 million people that, that are food insecure in this country or that are food stressed. And often those two words mean two different things but, but, the, but the real challenge is right now is that there are people in our country that are starving. Uh, and it's, it's moved from behind the curtain to, to, to the center of the screen, literally, that we are now dealing with it on a day by day basis. It's about, for me, two major things. It's about access and, and the, 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 the opportunity for people to access the resources they need. And it's about decision making their right to decide the kinds of foods they want to access. We've, and, and this goes all the way from policy to design. Uh, let me speak about design for just a moment. For just a moment. Um, we've not designed our townships to be food producers. We've not designed those houses and streets and communities to be food independent. We've designed it so that they will always be food dependent on an external resource to grow food for them. Uh, because they, 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 they plot their land is just too small that they'd be given to grow food on. And so, yes, we, we've grown the concept of communal gardens and on the outskirts of townships, there are these amazing projects taking place all over the country. But, but for an individual family, food insecurity, food security is a, a, is a myth in this country. If you are poor, you are food insecure and you are at risk. Um, and so in, in, in that world, the COVID-19 context has torn that curtain wide open. And suddenly we are seeing how food insecure and food stressed families are. And, and that's what I think the conversation must be about tonight. It's the, it's the truth we've always known and have never spoken about. 
Thank you, to Lorenzo. Just in terms of process, colleagues, I've 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 asked the uh, speakers if they would be comfortable if we use first name basis. That's why I'll, I'll be so forward to to address them on the on the first name. So, uh, Tulasizbe, maybe from your side, an additional introduction to food, food security as a field, um, and then uh, please uh, please you go into your five minute input, and and then I'll ask uh, Maris and Lorenzo to do so as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Rudy. I, I think Lorenzo has covered basically everything in terms of um, a definition to food security, introducing the concept, except that I would like to emphasize that it's not just about availability, which he mentioned, but I just want to, to emphasize that it's about the access to the food that is available. South Africa is said to be food insecure at a national level. And as you correctly said, at household level, there are many households that are food insecure. So the issue in this case is not the availability of food at a national level, but is how to individual households and, and individual people access that food, which then brings in the issue of affordability. Is this food affordable? Can everybody afford it? And I think just to capture it all, the fact that there's food there, if you don't have the means or the buying power to access that, given the situation that has just been painted, that's not all, most of us don't produce our own food. We rely on food that comes from an external source external to the household, which then means there must be a currency of accessing that food that you've not produced. So by way of introduction, I'll say that the issue of South, South African food, uh, food security issue is, 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 got two, is, is mainly premised on the two of the four pillars of food security, which is availability and access. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So if I could ask you by way of introduction for the conversation, your, your, your first input, how would you how would you sort of um, direct us in our in, in how we should reflect about the current situation that we face? Uh, it is a particular context with the pandemic. Um, it asks particular questions of how we facilitate agriculture as a almost essential service. Um, uh, where where do we go from here? Uh, what is happening at the moment, and and how do we proceed? Over to you. It's a total order that you've just put before me, but I'll try and, and respond to it. First and foremost, I must say that at, at a policy level, the government of South Africa, in my view, has, has responded appropriately, given the unexpected uh, turn of events that we found ourselves in come the beginning of this, of this year, technically speaking. And uh, I think what we should be doing as a society is that we should, we should keep agriculture safely running as an essential service or essential business, like you have said because that is the source of our food. Before it even gets processed process and gets to the supermarket in whatever shape and form, it needs to be, have been produced at a primary level. So it's very important that we keep agriculture going. And I think it's a good move that the government saw it fit to exempt agriculture even during the lockdown and, and designate it as an, essential, as an essential service because it is an essential service. Everybody has to eat on a daily basis regardless of whatever crisis that we find yourself, ourselves in. So we need to actually make sure that agriculture is a going concern and that there is affordable and there's, there's an affordable and nutritious food that is available to all people at all times. I know it's easier said than done because we've always said that people have got a right to, 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 to food, but it's not every, everybody that can exercise that right because of a number of reasons. And we need to also <laughs> make sure that food gets to the places where it is required, despite the, the limitation in movement that the lockdown and the pandemic has brought upon the South African society. I think I will leave it at that as a way of introduction. Perfect, thank you very much. I, uh, I wonder if I, Marius, if I could ask you to, to share with us your initial comments to get the conversation set. Uh, thank you, Rudy, and good evening to all the listeners and participants. Uh, I think to think about food security in this current situation, there are two uh, main things to think about. The one is to think about South Africa's labor force and the structure of that labor force in the economy. And the second is to think about the realities on the ground that flow from that. Now, in terms of the labor force, you know, South Africa is a population of 58 to 59 million people but only about 7 million of those people work in the formal economy, which means that they're getting salaries and pay slips. And so in a, in a COVID pandemic, as we were going through at the moment, where the economy is on a lockdown, 
uh, those in the formal economy might go home, uh, but they still would receive a salary into a bank account, you know, from a company. But there's a very large portion of South Africa, 18 million people who are receiving social grants, and then an additional 11 million people of working age that are unemployed. And those individuals in South Africa rely not on the formal economy, but the informal economy. So these are individuals that go out, they look for what they call a peace job, uh, they look for an informal, part-time, daily opportunity to make a living or just to survive to get by. And so when South Africa went into a lockdown environment, of course, those uh, many, many millions of people were unable to raise any kind of income. And as South Africa has gone deeper into the lockdown, the financial resources at their disposal has become less and less. And over time, what that means is even though they're surrounded by food in the shopping centers and the grocery stores and in the food trucks uh, distributing that food and even in the spaza shops, they're unable to get their hands on that food. Now, we've seen that ballooning in local communities uh, in and around where we live, in suburbs, in Cape Town, in, in Gauteng, in Durban, in all kinds of parts of the country. And the deeper we get into the lockdown, the more serious this problem will become. Yeah, thank you very much, Marius. Uh, Lorenzo, um, your, your, your first inputs. Okay, sorry. I'm unmuted. Both of the colleagues have hit, you know, various aspects of this particular challenge, uh, you know, I think quite squarely. I, I think that, that let's begin with the issues around policy access, policy and access. I think um, there's a need to re revisit policy in this country. Uh, there needs to be a, a conversion of structured policy around food security as a mainstream item. So we speak of transversal government. Um, we speak of of a, a department of cooperative governance. I think this matter is a cooperative governance issue. Uh, it doesn't just reside in the Department of Health or in the Department of Trade and Industry or in the Department of Agriculture. Th this does need an overarching uh, stream within government that is tasked with food security. And, and so my initial response is, how do we get policy right in this country to ensure that at a leadership level, we have the right minds in the room that designs the system? This is not just about a government minister sitting down or a, a, a uh, you know, bureaucrat somewhere, a DG sitting down and saying, okay, we're gonna, we're in charge of food security. These are specialists, these are specialist fields. It's, it's like Dr. McCabella uh, and it's like uh, uh, Mr. Eisen and others coming into the space and, and saying, hold on, this is how we do the design of the system. Because again, we, we, we can't afford the risk of of experimenting. I said years ago when I was on a, on a panel with a particular government department, I said that I'm a, I'm a pilot project skeptic. I, I am, I'm averse to pilot projects because we, 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 owe, we, we give ourselves the luxury to spend millions testing something, then we all walk away and say, no, it didn't work. And, and we leave communities who have been the test cases just standing there saying the government is not coming back, they left. And we've seen these failed pilot projects all around the place because from the design point of view, we were not, we did not bring the specialist into the room. The right people needs to be in the room. And it's, when I say specialist, I don't just mean academic specialists. I mean, people with a lived story, people with a lived reality that all feed into that design. And, and then we, we come up and say, this is what we've designed. And so at a policy level, first of all, I think there's a design problem around food security in this country. Thank you, Lorenzo. I'd like to ask uh, to ask uh, uh, to Lassizwe to maybe respond. You know, um, you know the policy context for 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 this part of of our country's response um, to COVID. You think there's limitations in our policy? Where's the gaps, if any? Um, and how how would we be able to engage with these? Um. I would tend to agree with Lorenzo in terms of saying that there, there is space to improve in terms of policy in South Africa. Despite South Africa being loaded as a country that's got very good policies and less implementation, but I think we can also tweak the, the, the policies that we have to actually address the first need at a particular time. Because when food security was, the policies around you to develop, it was under a different dispensation, dispensation in terms of what was happening in the country. 
And I think as South African society, we, we tend to be obsessed with, uh, for lack of a better word, with transformation. Each and every policy that we do, we're trying to overload it with too many objectives. For example, the land reform policy is overloaded with not just giving land to people so they can produce food. There are a lot of underlying and undertones to the policy of land reform. There's also the social, there's the political. And for me, it becomes problematic to actually be able to measure whether you've succeeded or not, because you can choose one of the objectives and say, we've done well here, we've transferred so many hectares of land. But what, what is that land doing, as an example? But coming back to food security, that even those people that are at the cold face of delivering on what the policy expects of government to do, have a different understanding of what food security is. My experience in food security in the country is that it has taken us very long to actually come to a broader understanding of what food security is. Government thinking has been that if you give people a, a starter packs to do home gardens and you give them food passes and people are food secure. To me, that's a limited understanding of what food security is. There are people, as Lorenzo correctly said in his opening remarks, that will never be able to produce food for themselves because of where they are. If you live in a block of flats, you don't even have a square, a square meter that belongs to you that you can till and plant. It's pointless to tell you how to plant. We, we don't have the access of where to plant. But if you give people the buying power, the opportunity to make money so that they can access the food that other people in, in the economy are producing, they can even access the spaza shops and buy food there. So for me, it's broader than just producing your own food and producing food per se, but it's actually having that access and affording the food. So the policy that, policies that we, we develop should look at the context and say, this is what we're trying to achieve as a country, food security for all. But what do we do with people who are in formal settlements who don't even own the, the land where the shack is standing, they could be moved tomorrow or could be moved today, and they don't even have land to till. How do you make sure that those people have enough to eat? So if I could uh, sort of, based on what you raised, ask Marius, you know, um, you know, if you, uh, when we talk about land reform and its influence in, in, in this conversation, this particular challenge of the country, if we talk about access to land, um, if we talk about the architecture of, of, of the apartheid city and where it left, uh, left township communities, um, at a point where we need food now because we have a pandemic, how do we decide between the long-term solutions and the immediate interventions that we need? So Ria, I think that's a great question. And I, I thought I'd share a couple of slides if I could of a, a, a very specific situation that I think paints a picture of precisely this issue of land and food security, the short-term need versus the long-term need. Uh, this is a, an incident in the, the city of Tswane uh, where in the last month, you know, we've seen individuals like these mothers with small babies come out into the suburbs to sit and beg for food in one particular incident, a mother was arrested, leaving her children in the township, and it took two weeks for us to get the police to release her uh, because she was an undocumented migrant. Now, this goes to this issue of the apartheid spatial settlements in South Africa and the way land works. This particular case is of the, the Moy Plas informal settlement. But the interesting thing is this is not an apartheid era township. This is a township that has sprung up during the last 10 years in South Africa. The oldest residents say that they've been there for about 12 years that I've spoken to. And, you know, we, when this food security problem emerged, we did an analysis and found that there are 10,000 informal dwellings in this township. So to give you a sense of that, if there's 2.7 people per, per dwelling, this is a group of 27,000 people living on the doorstep of the suburbs that have no running water, no electricity. And when we then talk about land access, these people at a fundamental level are unable to do anything productive such as produce food. Uh, we spoke to one particular lady and asked her, you know, she, she's a Zimbabwean migrant. And we said to her, would you go home if you had the choice? And she said, yes, I would. And we said, well, uh, we hear that things are worse in Zim. Why would you go there rather than stay here? And she said, you know, in Zim, at least I can plant something to survive. Yeah, because I'm illegally on the land, government won't allow me to plant uh, the local community won't allow me to plant. And to, to paint that picture of the short-term need, uh, we were able to work with some communities to raise food for this community. And the outcome of that was over the last week and a half, 
a queue of four kilometers long of Zimbabweans, Mozambicans, Malawians, some South Africans. These are people during the lockdown pandemic queuing for food with no social distancing and no masks. And so really the debate that we have to have in South Africa is not just the debate about broad land reform, taking farms from one group to give farms to the other group. It's really a fundamental debate about how do we use the land in South Africa much more productively and how do we make that possible for the little guy, which in this case are, you know, are migrants, many of whom are undocumented, how do we make food security the center of how we think about our spatial organization of South Africa? And that's a much more sophisticated debate than the simple debate that we're having about taking one commercial farm from one owner and giving it to another owner. It's a much broader societal discussion. Do I see is there any, any comment in addition? And, and uh, Lorenzo, then I'll give to you. Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Rudy. I, I couldn't agree more that we need to be broader in, in our approach and also be specific at the same time. What are we trying to address in a particular given area rather than just having a, one brush that paints the problem and the solution to everything at once? So I, I think there's a realis realization that um, the way that we've done land reform, when I say we, I mean we as, as, as a country, we've done land reform in the past uh, 10, 12 years hasn't been really the way it's supposed to be done because a, a vast amount of that land is not productive anymore. And sometimes you take a piece of land from one individual commercial farmer who was barely making ends meet for himself and his family, and you give it to a community of people and you expect them to make a living out of it. And people just turn that into a dwelling space rather than a farm, a farm area. So land reform needs to, to be targeted and make sure that you're transferring agricultural land for agricultural purposes and also transfer land for residential for residents for residential purposes so that has to be quite strict about in terms of doing that and i think we also have to be very much awake to, to the re, to the reality that in south africa there are so many undocumented people immigrants that come from neighboring states and neighboring countries that you can't just wish them away and you can't just be feeding south africans and let them starve next to, next to where the south africans are and it also ferments issues like um, your your xenophobic attacks that people then start believing that one group has come to take what belongs to them. We need to be, as a society, embrace the people that live within the borders of South Africa. If they are illegal and undocumented, we deal with how we actually address that issue. Because the, the humanity of dealing with human beings should never be lost in, in the whole equation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lorenzo? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to just probably ponder this issue uh, a bit on, on how, how we have um, uh, sort of failed to appreciate the, the depths of agriculture in this country. Um, I think uh, I agree with Tulasis with the fact that, you know, we, we, we can redistribute land, but the deepening of the value of that process lies in a, in a grand scheme of agricultural development. And that goes all the way through from leadership training to obviously the science of agriculture to how people value that process. Indigenously, not just you know, foreign trained, but indigenous knowledge about land. How we bring all those resources together so that when a, a woman steps into a farm, she, she, she knows what she's gonna do with that land. She, she learns with the land. Um, she begins to grow with the land. And, and that process, that nurturing, that leadership, that that investment in the process is where I think we have a big gap. So, so we have, again, come back to what I, what I said earlier, we, we don't have a food design system, we don't have a food security system, and we don't have the mentoring, the leadership, the guidance, the investment made to make sure that whether you're a small scale farmer, you're a big farmer somewhere else, you're a novice on a farm, you, you're, a, you're a young person that wants to grow food for, 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 for his village or, or for their town, the thinkers, the, the thinkers must work with those people. They must be willing to invest time, money, and energy into that young man. Uh, if we keep doing the grand scaling of this thing, uh, we will end up with nothing at the bottom because there's no deepening of the agricultural design system. So we have great theorists. We have, we, we have wonderful land in this country. 
We are the most food secure country on the continent of Africa. We are 55th out of 133 countries on the hunger index. We are better than most countries in the world. But I fear that, that the bottom of this process is unstable and it's hugely unstable. Um, we're going to go another five years down the road if we go like this, and we're going to have an extremely food insecure country because the deepening is not happening. Yeah, just uh, interesting. Um, um, if, if you could maybe share with us some of, from some of the work that uh, communities have been doing in terms of, of uh, distributing or, or uh, food parcels and support to communities. Um, many of the of the of the heroes that we celebrate in the media uh, are, are mothers in uh, in local communities and townships who put up uh, soup kitchens and provide food irrespective of what the lockdown requirements would be. On the other side, you have uh, I think a, a media report uh, from yesterday, if I have it correct, of a uh, of a young man in um, in Cape Town who uh, reportedly would uh, provide food to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to people, um, uh, unsheltered people um, in the area and whose, whose vehicle was burnt overnight after mm -hmm. someone published his, his address uh, and, and so on social media. So it all brings into play not only the systems of production and availability, but also distribution, how, you know, almost the politics of food, food security. Um, how does that work? You know, on the one hand, we have community work, uh, and other hand, there seems to be an underlying uh, conflict around around food and and who gets it and who shares it. Yeah, I'll quickly step in. I think one of the big risks that we have in COVID nineteen right now is that we are going to broaden this food relief work uh, across the country. We have. In the Western Cape, I think 377,000 households that are food insecure. Um, we, 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 have the, we have 24 municipalities here and each of them have a number of indigent households. <coughs> uh, some, some small towns, as many as 16,000 indigent households. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a significant crisis. The point around this is that we cannot be a country subjected to food relief as a policy continually because food relief does not bring food security. It brings food dependency. And we got to grow the agricultural basis of this country to establish that kind of food security. Giving people boxes of food is an interim measure. It should always stay an interim measure because we have to make sure that our system can produce enough food so that a sense of food security returns. Now, let me give you an example quickly, and I'll end with this story. Uh, I want to comment on the Cape Town story quickly as well. Uh, a, a while back, I've told this before, I went to a soup kitchen that we fund in an area uh, here in Cape Town on the Cape Flats. And there were people standing in the, in the soup line, in the food, food feeding line. And I noticed something which struck me for the first time. There was a mother standing in the soup line with her daughter and the daughter had her baby on the hip. So the mother was there, the daughter was there and the granddaughter was there. And suddenly it dropped with me. That's three generations standing in a food line. And the mother has not been made food secure. The daughter has not been made food secure. And the granddaughter is at risk of not being made food secure either. And we see this daily in our country that three generations, sometimes up to four generations are standing in a food line. And as a policy maker for us, that must be un unacceptable. We have to end it at some point because soon there will be five generations, at least in a given food, food line. Which is, a, which is an indictment on our richness as a nation. And so when you take a particular case that happened in, in Seapoint in Cape Town, where a where food volunteer dished out food to homeless people and, and he gets attacked for that, it speaks to the very core, the fundamental wrongness of, of the nature of, of how we are as human beings. It speaks to the core of, of going against the essence of our democracy. It speaks against what the president said when he locked down this country, when he said, we're going to come out with a, with a new consciousness, a new economy, and a new society. The three, the three news he spoke about when he locked us away on the 26th of, of March. He said, hopefully this moment will be a, a period for us to grow as a, as a, a, grow a new consciousness, a, a new economy, and emerge as a new people from this. 
And, and all we are seeing now is that there's this continuing widening gulf in some communities, and I can't generalize that it's everywhere, in some communities where people are agitated by the relief given because it's happening in their neighborhoods. And so they burn people's cars who help other people, uh, who bring food to other people. I mean, that is just bizarre. That is the extreme of bizarre, uh, that you can burn someone's car who is bringing food relief so that they don't feed in your neighborhood. So Tulasi's way, Marius, so I'll ask you just now, but Tulasi's way, so food can be, um, you know, uh, an, an angry matter for our people, you know, and and feeds into many social challenges that we have. Uh, you know, if you, if you read on food insecurity, uh, much of the causes are actually put down to poverty or unemployment or, or so forth. What's the relationship between the two, between whether we have food and, and, and what we do with it, or what we do and the fact that we don't have food? You, you are correct. They, there's a saying that says a hungry man is an angry man. So when people are, are, are hungry, they will definitely be angry because they need food for sustenance. And if you look at the recent uprisings, what the so-called Arab, Arab, Arab Spring and all that, it sprang out of a very similar situation where people were hungry and they thought they were not being uh, taken care of. And there's no, there's, there's no way of avoiding the link or the correlation between poverty and, and food, food insecurity. Because it, it's always the poor people that will feel the brunt of food insecurity in any given society. And I think as, as a country, going back to the issue of agriculture that Lorenzo spoke of earlier on, is that we need to actually correct, fundamentally transform the system of agriculture in terms of the value chains that we have and build resilient and sustainable value chains so that we make sure that even in a crisis, as a nation, we can still produce enough food. What I mean by that is that our agriculture is very developed and very well-respected internationally, but the bulk of what we do and what we use as inputs is imported from somewhere else. And that does not mean South Africa cannot be producing those, in, those, those inputs. But for historical reasons, we've continued to, Im, to import a lot of um, important agricultural inputs like fertilizer, animal feed, um, animal medications and all that, which we cannot produce without. And I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people that advocate that we need to now, coming out of this COVID-19 pandemic, think of a better economy, as the president said, an economy that will also be generating and producing inputs into the agriculture rather than just producing the food itself. But the inputs that goes into producing the food need to be as much as possible be sourced locally. And when you do that, you expand the economy. There are a lot of people that will play in the input space and actually then people will be more will be employed and gainfully employed. And we also move away from the, 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 the problem of when our currency depreciates against the major currencies in this world, it becomes very expensive to bring in the inputs for agriculture, which then it's then transmitted to the consumer. Food becomes expensive because the process has been an expensive process. I think that, that to me, the link is very clear that a proper functional agricultural system will help us with food security and, and deal with the issue of food insecurity in the country. So if I understand correctly, it's, it's, it's not only a matter of whether uh, a society wants to care for, for itself and people and citizens for one another. It's often that we don't know how to or the means to actually, you know, build the sector and also facilitate access. We don't actually have the tools to do it. And even though I might want to do it, I want to ask Marius uh, maybe to comment as well on this, on this broader process. Of, of bringing a country to make these shifts in, in how you, how do you do that? How do you offer a leadership direction? Do you think that, uh, you know, there's some advice to offer to, uh, to our leadership in the country, broadly speaking, politically and otherwise, in, in how to direct um, almost the spirit of a country to, to highlight this as a main item, as Lorenzo had indicated? Marius, what's your view? So thank you, Rudy. I think that, you know, there are two things to say, and then I might share a slide uh, uh, relating to this. Uh, the first is that this problem is not something that one party is going to deal with on its own. Uh, you know, if government imagines that it can fix food security and land in South Africa on its own, it's, it's deluded. Similarly, you know, it's not something the people can do or business can do on its own. 
And so the first thing to say is this is something that we as South Africa would have to take a collective approach in addressing. And then the second thing, and I'll, I'll share a little bit of work that we've done here when, you know, when the, the land reform debate came to its height in South Africa two years ago, we sat back and we said, well, what would all the components be of a national effort to address land reform in a way that's just, in a way that, le that leads to food security, that leads to more inclusion, that leads to job creation? And you know, what we said is really, and I'll, I'll just talk you through it very quickly, is that there are three sides to the story. The first is that there needs to be a diagnosis, not only of the ownership of land, but also of how does South Africa want to use its land? What is the value of the land in economic terms? And can we develop a new narrative about land? You know, in South Africa, land is something, when we talk about it, it's about pain and regret. But could land, and in this case, food security that flows from that, be a story about reconciliation? And how do we as a country turn this into a story about reconciliation? But of course, to do that, we have to have the tough negotiation, right? About expropriation as part of that, maybe not wholesale expropriation as we're being, as is being discussed. But we also have to talk about development. How do we develop the people of South Africa? You know, I drove through a town in December coming back from holiday where there was an agricultural school that was completely deserted. The walls were falling over. The roof had been blown off. And so do we have the institutions to develop the people of South Africa to be productive? And this comes to the question of how do we turn land and food into a commercial activity that includes South Africans broadly and that can, at the heart of it, address South Africa's unemployment crisis? Now, I'm strongly of the view, and that's what I've said here at the bottom, that land reform can be and actually be a flywheel for youth empowerment, in, uh, employment, for job creation. And the way we would do that is we would put food security at the center of the land reform debate. Now, that would require, to your question of how would a country do this, it would require that we have a sectoral dialogue and that the plans and the policies and the strategies we have as government, as the private sector, as business, as, as, uh, as, as citizens, that those flow from that dialogue and that we say to ourselves, what's the role of our cities, our farms, our agricultural department, and how do we come around this issue of food security? You see, in the end, I think, and, and I'll end with this, is that South Africa really is a very small market. And if we aim at only providing for South Africa's food needs, there's very little opportunity in food in South Africa in a highly commercialized, highly industrialized food value chain. But if we look north of, Af of South Africa and we say there's a billion Africans growing at four uh, children per family means there's going to be 2.5 billion Africans in our lifetime that need food, that need sustenance. How can South Africa position to be a low cost, high quality food provider for the African market and for markets elsewhere? If we did that, the irony is that food security and land reform could be one of the things that unlocks South Africa's potential and brings all those unemployed people into the economy in a way that's quite meaningful. So it certainly can be done, but it would have to mean that uh, some put their egos aside and come around the table as South Africans and say, how do we do this together? Uh, Rudy, I think you're muted, apologies. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I'm I'm on now. So, no, it's interesting. The the thank you for that, Marius. The 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 comments are beginning beginning to stream in, colleagues from uh, from uh, from the broader audience. Um, so, an interesting th thought that I think as a theme is emerging from what everyone is sharing is the idea of of uh, leveraging the potential that we have for food production in the country. It seems we'd agree that we have enough land. Um, it seems to, we seem to agree that we have uh, sufficiently refined production cycles and processes. We have value chains well established, but somehow we're not, we're not uh, realizing the potential. So, Tula um, um, uh, Siswa, I could maybe ask your, your comment from a research perspective and your reading of, 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 of agriculture in the country. How far have we progressed um, and how are we progressing in terms of, of, of a forward movement to realize the potential of what we have in land. How far, how far are we in, and how's it going with that um, in terms of growing our agricultural contribution? 
Uh, I think as a country, I'll start by saying that we have a, a well-developed agricultural sector, especially the commercial part of the agricultural sector. But we, we have not really progressed much since where we were, say, 20, 30 years ago in terms of food production and agricultural production in the country. And one of the reasons is that we've sort of neglected um, science and technology, which is a research and development into, uh, into, into agriculture, because the environment within which one practices agriculture is dynamic. There is climate change, there are new diseases, plants and animals that we see coming in. And if we lag behind in terms of our re research and development, we'll always be chasing these things and reacting to them. And people have been talking about climate smart agriculture for a number of years now, but we haven't really adopted it to a way where we've embraced that climate change is here, it's, it's with us, it's inevitable, and then we need to move towards actually being climate smart in what we produce. I think we can't carry on doing agriculture as we've always done historically because this, the situation has changed. In fact, what we consider as traditional agriculture is also an evolution of what our early forefathers did when they were just tilling the land many years ago. So we also need to, to, to move with speed in terms of catching up with it. The, the, the tension is that at the policy making level, we want to make everything labor intensive so that we can absorb the people that are unemployed. And then we start building sectors with creating jobs, even more than their capacity to create jobs. And then we end up not really promoting innovations that seem to be labor saving. And, 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 and in my view is that it's not either or. You can be advancing in terms of technology and at the same time, developing higher quality jobs within the agricultural sector itself. Because the, the more you mechanize, the more you, you get advanced as an agricultural sector, you need to be teaching the right skills to the youth, especially, so that they're within the sector, but not necessarily digging and tilling the land as we used to do with the hoe, with, with the hoe in your hand, but actually be involved somewhere along the value chain. And that will even appeal more and absorb more people into the sector. So to, um, a short answer to the question is that there is room to grow in terms of advancing in agricultural production to realize the potential of, of uh, to realize the potential that we have as a country. But we also have to be mindful that there is what people call a, a natural resource degradation. The same land that used to be productive is not necessarily as productive as it was before, depending on how it has been managed. And without getting technical, we need to also look after the land itself to make sure that we exploit it properly without, without it degrading it. So thank you, um, So if we can just look at the at, at the comments that's coming through in the chat box, and I think colleagues will be able to read it there. Um, one of the first first uh, comments uh, by Andre Young um, asking Lorenzo for you to comment deals with technology, you know, and the opportunities that that bring um, um, in terms of optimizing distribution um, distribution of, of of food. And I think it's a key question in terms of the basics. I, I want to add uh, uh, Joe Samuel's question. Uh, a little bit, uh, beauty, a little bit down to ask why, in actual fact, do we need to, to, to give food parcels? You know, uh, uh, is is when we burn a car because of someone, uh, you know, uh, handing out food to to homeless people, uh, is there a justified cause in saying, but food parcels is, is uh, it's taking us back, not forward? So. Lorenzo, in terms of technology and uh, and food parcels, do you want to give us a comment? And uh, Tulas, I could ask you. You'll see, there's a there's a comment by Mfundo around uh, around urban food security, uh, rooftop gardens, vertical farming, etc. Is that a solution for us? If we, if we look at what's happening in, uh, in in our urban areas, so Lorenzo to you, and then Tulas Izwe and uh, Marius, then we're getting to the next set of questions for you. Oh. Okay, I, I, I've, I've listened to Maurice carefully and I think he has some, some wonderful ideas around how this could work. Let me say, at the start, I'm a firm believer in that we can never become a nation of food parcels. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's an indictment on the value of our democracy. Yes, multiple sources of, of food, absolutely. So food parcels in the system, yes. But that is an extreme resource. We should be teaching natural access, natural opportunities, an economy 
that empowers people with the resources to purchase food or to grow food, not to be dependent on someone else to give them a, a food meal box that they are bound to make only the food that's in that box. It takes away choice, it takes away that freedom, that creativity. So no, we can never become a nation of food boxes. And I, and I hope to God that we, that we see this as an extreme relief method, but it's not a sustainable method to provide food security for a country. On the issue of technology, I, I think people like, uh, I mean, institutions like Gibbs and Bertha and others are all, <coughs> I think, experts in the space where I, the technology exists to solve this problem. I mean, uh, the World Economic Forum says food is the most solvable problem in the world right now. Um, in their commentary about food security, they say it's the most solvable problem in the world right now. And, and we have the systems, the technologies to, to plot that. At a small scale now, we know every single house that we have dropped food at on our system. We can call it up GIS mapping, whatever it is. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. This is not hard science. The tech exists and it's been around for a number of years now that people can now on their cell phones go and log in that the box of food that they were given has now expired or is now used up that they would like another box. And they can do that on their cell phones. We've got the technology for that. Uh, we have suppliers who can say to us, um, I've run out of soya mints, but I have uh, another product that I can replace it with. And we know that this week, that's what we're going to be handing out. That, that's no longer amazing science. That's no longer amazing tech. And we have to use that, that tech to make sure that we get to, to where the system works for everybody. The point of all of this is multiple systems all coming to one point, and that is to provide a mother, a father, a young person with a decision-making power to get access to food that they want. The moment we deny them the access and the decision-making power, we diminish their agency, their sense of self-determination about what they want to eat. In, in poverty relief work, we don't talk about poverty eradication and poverty elimination and uh, uh, whatever the other words are. Uh, poverty eradication, poverty elimination, poverty relief. We don't talk of that. We talk of the concept of wealth creation for poor people. And so, 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 so no one wants to say the words, we're doing wealth creation for poor people. And at Community Chest, we insist on that we don't do poverty relief work. We do wealth creation work. Because wealth creation is the power to make your own decisions about what school you want to go to, what food you want to eat, what hospital do you want to go to, uh, where do you want to uh, walk to today? That independence of that independence of agency, that's wealth. And, and, and we are stuck in a poverty relief model because we have never thought of poor people as wealth creators. We just want them to get to the $2 a day mark. And boy, then we, then we can write our annual reports and clap our hands and say, we've done a marvelous job. We've relieved their poverty. But they are still poor. They are not competitive in a market where they can make their own decisions. And we should get out of this food box mentality we do it. We do thousands of food boxes, but it's an unsustainable option for a country as wealthy as us. We cannot keep it going. When we have agricultural land, production means that can sustain the food needs of this country. Nasiswe, urban, urban uh, food security. Will rooftops work for us? Is there a solution for us there? Yeah, urban food security, food insecurity is a serious problem because usually the people that are food insecure in urban areas are the people that do not have access to land, productive land. And the, the issue of rooftop, roof, rooftop gardens sounds like it's a good idea, but it's not a solution on its own. It, it's part of the solution. And there are people that don't even have roofs that can have gardens, so to speak. If you look at informal settlement, when you talk about a rooftop garden, I, I, I'm not sure what form it will take in terms of that because you need a proper roof to actually do that. And having said that, we should be encouraging urban agriculture so that we can produce food closer to where the people are and then encourage market, market outlets like uh, your farmer's markets, even for the small scale farmers that produce under urban agriculture to come together on a Saturday or whatever and sell the produce that they have so that people know where they can go to access food. But yes, I think all hands must be on deck as, as we try and deal with the issue of food, food, food insecurity in the country, including vertical agriculture, vertical farming, 
and, and rooftop gardens where those can work. And uh, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we can do that as, as well as we can, but there are certain things that you cannot produce under those circumstances, which comes back to the issue that Lorenzo has been, has been, has been emphasizing that food security is also about the choice and the freedom to choose what kind of food you want to access in the marketplace or wherever the food comes from. For example, if people choose that as their incomes grow, they want to eat more protein, they want to eat more meat, red meat for argument's sake, you can you, you can hardly ever produce that in the in the kind of uh, agricultural system that are being suggested in urban areas because then you open up opening up society to a number of other things where people are now exposed to zoonotic diseases that can be transmitted from animals to people. So we need to have a very, a very good balancing act as we promote certain activities within localities. Thank you. Uh, Marius, I'd like you to respond to, to a comment or a question by June Knight regarding the uh, sort of the big supermarkets, you know, uh, talking about the value chain and who actually facilitates access and affordability of, uh, of, of, of food. But, but before we get to that, June also makes a comment around, um, around uh, gender uh, in our panel, that there's no woman in our panel and well noted. But the point that she makes is that, that also uh, come from Lorenzo's, uh, you know, uh, sharing on, on the women, the three generations in, um, in, uh, in the food line. Um, you know, uh, it seems that to women it falls to provide food. Um, and so the question I would ask uh, to La is to what extent in, in the research of, uh, of, of your institution and so forth, um, do women um, as providers actually play a role? Um, and what, what voice do they have um, in, uh, in, in, in food security as a field? Uh, so if I respond briefly to the point about great, uh, the retailers, I'm always reminded of a comment that the head of the International Labour Organization in Africa made uh, when he explained to me that if a, a retailer, a large retailer in South Africa opens up next to a township or an informal settlement, they can close up to 300 informal shops in the process. Because as people get access to that bulk wholesale procured low cost pr uh, provision, it eliminates the competitiveness of those small scale uh, businesses. And of course, that has a decimating effect on the livelihoods of many of those people. Now, the solution to that is not, in my mind, uh, to demonize the retailers and say that they're bad, because there are some very good things about the retailers. You know, in South Africa, we're able to get a small uh, berry that's grown somewhere in the Western Cape, where, where you're all up here to Gauteng at a reasonable cost uh, in, a, in a refrigerated truck, because we have a highly developed uh, food value chain with distribution that's highly efficient. However, it's not an inclusive system. And the reason it's not an inclusive system really comes down to the question of ownership, of who owns the land, who owns the, 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 the agricultural processing capability, who owns the logistics, who owns the distribution, and ultimately, who owns the last mile retail distribution. And so what we need to do in South Africa is take, take a step back from that system and say, if we don't think that system is fair, and if we don't think it's appropriate for our society, how do we create the laws and the regulations to protect us from monopoly behavior on the one side, but also to protect the capability of that industry? And instead of closing it down and destroying it, how do we give more people in South Africa access to that industry? And we are seeing some retailers experimenting with us by giving shelf space uh, to, to low, uh, small scale producers. But I think we need a more fundamental conversation, which is about the localization of production. You know, we've spoken about urban farming, vertical farming, uh, and, and we'll see the circular economy as we have an energy transition and, and more water recycling. We'll see the, the emergence of urban-based uh, farming in fresh produce, for instance. And so when we localize production, what that will do is it will shorten the value chain and the distribution chain. And if we can bring, especially women, as we were saying in the next comment, into the ownership structures of that localization of production. What that will do over time is it will transform the retail space and make it a much more inclusive system for South Africa. 
thank you, Marius. Uh, Tulasis, where your comment? Where's where's women's voice in uh, in this in this movement? It's a pity that it, at this day and age, women still don't have as much voice as one would would, would like to see happening in society. And uh, it is true that it's the burden of food, providing food for the family heavily uh, falls on, on the women's shoulders, especially in rural poor communities where the men are either working away from the, from, from the homes and they don't even see when the kids go to, go to sleep on an empty stomach. So the mother is always there. They, the women are always trying to provide for, for, for their families in terms of, uh, in terms of food in, in our societies. The research has shown that um, the bulk of small-scale agricultural production is done by women, but those women do not have the agency or the voice to actually make decisions. They still revert to the men, either in the household or in the community, especially where the land is communally owned. Because the land ownership in traditional areas is still skewed towards men. So the short response to that is that women do not have sufficient voice, especially when it comes to the issue of food security, despite the fact that they are the ones who pay the brunt, the, the, the biggest brunt of food insecurity in our society. So I think it's a critical suggestion, um, you know, indicated that in, in the research environment, we actually have specific, uh, you know, initiatives to, to, to give that voice and to have that practical experience living you know in policy if you will but you know if you want to comment it you 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 really must you really must welcome to say more about that um so how's it in research do you actually in the in the research environment uh, make the effort a lot of effort is being made to actually give women the voice i know it sounds terrible when you say give women the voice because who is giving them who are you to give them the voice as it were but for lack of a better way of putting it, there's a lot of work that's being done to actually make sure that women have the voice. And a lot of women researchers that are actually advocating for this. And for me, it's, it's not a gender issue of, um, or what, what you, or how should I put it? It should not be left to women to fight for this voice to be heard. It, should, it has to be a societal issue where society says women are better placed in, in, in terms of taking care of the families in feeding them. So they should have more say in what can be produced, the production decisions, and also the purchasing decisions of what, with the income that we have as a household, what do we buy? What is it that is required to make sure that the family is food, is food secure? So there is a lot of work that's being done where there, is, there are even principle, um, research um, streams that talk about women empowerment in agriculture, where people actually measure. So, how much women are empowered in, in particular societies, especially in the rural areas. So there is research being done. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, if, we, if we can move, you know, there was another question asked by, by Noel Daniels around, around policy and implementation. In a sense, I want to add to that sort of the notion of political will. So I wonder if I could ask Lorenzo and Marius to respond. Lorenzo, what's your, what's, what's your sense in terms of political will in the country to actually make the shifts that you refer to in terms of a transversal cent you know, centering of, of, of food security. Um, do we have the political will? Um, are we going that route? And Maris, I'd like to ask you to respond as well after Lorenzo. Thank you, Lorenzo. So, so um, let me just unmute myself, I think. And now I'm open. Um, I, I am vexed about the question of political will, I must say. I think I have a willing president. I don't think I have a willing cabinet. So let me put it at that level. Then I think at the DG level, I think I have overwhelmed DGs who don't understand, Marius then would know this probably better, how management systems should work for, for a a country that is teetering in multiple spheres that needs a careful managed plan to go forward. How do you bring complexity, chaos, um, all these things that we talk about in, in, in design thinking, how do you bring all of that together and, and lead it? Um, and, and I think, so, so, so there's a fundamental 
leadership design problem in how we do government. And, and that, that fundamental problem has cut us off increasingly, increasingly, increasingly from government itself. So, so here's the thing. We were so amused that the president put his mask on wrong. It became the talk of the town. Because it's, it's such a relief to see somebody human. And, and, and I, I find it sad that, that that's who we've become. You know, what are the celebratory stories we tell? What's the great moments that we talk about? When we won the World Cup, we were all euphorious that we, we, we are the best in the world. To, to, I said in a, in a talk I gave shortly after, I said, if we have to have that level of euphoria to sustain us, we'll have to win a World Cup every weekend to keep this country going. It's, it's, it's the impossibility of what we vest in these few moments. And we need Gibbs and others and, and Tillis where and all these role players, all these things to get together and say, okay, our, our ministers needs a process. Our DGs need a process. Our chief directors need a process. Our, 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 our parastatals, our SOEs need a process. That I like what Mari said, put food security at the center of that process. And, and then let's talk. So how do we all work towards that? Um, that for me is so fundamentally important. I mean, you know, can we create production centers that are decentralized, that creates jobs? Could we create food systems that move from, from, from Bloemfontein to the far fields of the free state um, that, that's all managed by local communities? How do you turn this thing on its head? Um, uh, uh, I think it's Rosabeth Cantor from Harvard said in an article in the Harvard Review said that the post-COVID uh, leadership is leadership who can operate outside of hierarchies. She said the post-COVID-19 leadership is the leadership that can operate outside of hierarchies. You know, Malcolm Gladwell's book of, of outliers to some degree, but there's a real notion that people who have this profound sense of insight and can operate uh, they don't need a hierarchy to validate that. They are empowered individually. And we need to see more of those kinds of energies harnessed, bring them into the room. In fact, her book is titled um, Thinking Outside the Building instead of Thinking Outside the Box. She, she, she writes about thinking outside the building. So, so people who are organic in their leadership and, and they inspire us to achieve the kinds of realities that we are talking about here tonight. It is possible, but it begins with, with the, the cabinet. Do you ask me, is it possible with the cabinet? Absolutely. But there's a, there's a massive misalignment there and, and, and political will is, is, is relegated to a few um, that, that, I, that concerns me. And the same for, for provincial and, and municipal governments. I'm not, that's not just the cabinet. That is at provincial level and at municipal level. There's the same dysfunctionality. We, we, we are so obsessed with political affiliations and not about a political delivery system, a system that stands up to public scrutiny that we can all be proud of. Um, and sadly, that's, that's the kind of democracy that won't survive. Marius, your, your, your perspective on the matter? No, I, I think I'll agree with, with everything that Lorenzo said, you know, maybe just saying the same thing in different words that I think the one issue is what we would call state capacity you know, and in some ways, and this is not to excuse anybody, but, you know, what did we expect in South Africa when a group of people who were on the outside of the formal institutions of the state were given an opportunity through a liberation to take charge of a country, but really had very little experience in governing anything of scale. And so, you know, we've gone in South Africa through a series of iterations of giving different people a turn to try and run something that is highly complex and sophisticated. And so we, I don't think as South Africans, we should be surprised that there's been a dire lack of state capacity. You know, we talk about being a capable and developmental state, but if you're not a capable state, you can dream about being developmental. You're not going to develop anything. Now that's the one challenge is we haven't been honest, I think, as South Africans to say, we're not a capable state. To become a capable state, we have to develop the capacity of the people, and, and Lorenzo mentioned this, but we can't just have a, a strong treasury and a strong presidency. We need a strong every department in government, and not just at the national level. We need provincial and local government to be strong. You know, it's in 
local government that 90% of the work is done, where, where people, the, the reality of infrastructure and people and delivery is really done. And so state capacity is the one issue. But then there's the issue of governance. You know, you can have all the state capacity in the world if that state that's capacitated is using that capacity to rob the citizens of the resources of the citizens, then that state is not going to deliver. And so we've had a double challenge of a lack of state capacity and really shocking governance over the last 10 years. We've seen this ballooning of mismanagement and misallocation of resources, looting of state coffers. And what happens in a country like South Africa when you have no state capacity and, and lack of good governance is you end up hollowing out the capacity of the state to deliver to citizens. And so we shouldn't be surprised that we're in a debt situation now, that we're seeing very little done in terms of service delivery, and that South Africans have come onto the streets in the last two, three years to protest really a collapse of practical governance in many parts of the country. And that brings me to the third point, which is that I don't think there's a silver bullet that's going to solve South Africa's problems. And I don't, my own hope actually is not in government, because if I look at the state of the state, I think it's very likely that we are facing a decades long process of rebuilding the state, capacitating the state, strengthening the state. And we have to do that in the midst of such political battling and factionalism and infighting and self interest that me personally, the view is that my hope for South Africa is in South Africans. You know, in South Africa, when we were under apartheid, we had a strong state, which was an illegitimate abusive state. And then we moved to a democracy, thinking that we have a strong state that's going to give us houses, it's going to give us water, it's going to give us food, it's going to give us electricity. But the reality is South Africa actually has a fairly weak state with a weak capacity to serve us. And probably, if I had to do a forecast, I think the highest probability is that South Africans are going to have to find solutions for themselves. So instead of thinking of a big state with political will, I think we need a big society that says, what does this town look like? What does the city look like? What does the suburb look like? And if we do that as South Africans, what will happen is the accountability that we'll bring to the state will put pressure on the state and on government to have the political will and to serve the interests of the people. But that, unfortunately, is going to require a much more active citizenry than I think we've seen to date. Uh, uh, Tula I must, I must ask, do you agree uh, on, uh, on political will and, and, uh, and, uh, and our recent history of, 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 uh, of citizen, uh, citizen will? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to gather my thoughts and see how to respond to that, because I'm in a tight position when it comes to when, when, when it comes to those issues. I have my personal views, and I have my my institutional views that may not necessarily agree. So I would rather not respond to that right now. <laughs> no, I must say I, I know I was a, a, a little bit uh, uh, mischievous. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But uh, I thought you would be able to handle that mischievous a little bit. So. So thank you. Now there's interesting further comments. Um, I think um, uh, one of the one of the proposals or questions that Jade uh, Orgel is asking uh, is uh, is whether we should think of stockfell type systems uh, to work with with land, uh, public land, and so forth. And I'm not sure whether there's some examples of those policies where that that's already in existence that you could uh, could share share with us about. And then there's a, a question um, around around school, uh, school feeding schemes, school food growing programs, um, and I wonder if you maybe want to speak to both those 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 comments from Jane. Thank you very much. On the issue of um, using the Stockfell approach on land management and using land, I think that has been tried uh, for for a while in South Africa. We call them cooperatives where a group of people come together and, and, and want to work a piece of land to produce whatever it is that they're producing. My, my view is that um, this stock fail or cooperative kind of approach only works if it's initiated by the members of that stock fail rather than a government dangling a carrot to say, come together, then we'll give you support, we'll do this, we'll do one, two, three, because people come together when there is that resource that is being brought from somewhere to bring them together. 
I would rather have the stock fail. Let's start from the ground. People, let's share the same vision, want to achieve the same outcome. They start working together. Then government or anybody else can come and assist them. But it should never be driven from outside. And I think that can help, can work a lot if it's, it's driven by the people. The issue of school feeding schemes is a good is a good process, both for food security, addressing food insecurity in society, and also creating markets, especially for small scale farmers. Because then the state becomes an off taker of what the farmers produce in terms of then taking this and feeding it to the children in schools. If you look, in, if you look at other developed economies, the US, for example, they've got um, a lot of the school, school feeding schemes where they deliberately target what is in oversupply in the market and then they buy that from the farmers and then feed it to, to, to the schools, which then creates a market and at the same time addresses issues of food security. I think it's, it's a very good process if it can be done properly because government needs to learn to, to pay small scale, uh, small, small businesses within the, 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 the agreed um, period of time so that you don't then bankrupt them and then, then destroy their, their very existence by not paying them in time. And, this COVID-19 pandemic has also brought in um, a difficult situation where a number of young people who are school going age actually get their nourishment at school. Now with the lockdown and schools closed for such a long period of time, a number of these kids have been pushed into food insecurity positions where if it was um, business as usual, they would have had their food at school and they would have relieved even the mothers at home to actually look for three meals a day to feed them. So it, the, 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 the pandemic has actually put pressure on vulnerable societies even more, especially when it comes to food, food um, uh, schools feeding skills. Well, thank you very much. Um, um, of course, uh, Charlene Duncan had uh, commented here, and it brings us back to your initial point, uh, Lorenzo, that, that in actual fact, solutions would be a collaboration across government, business, academia, civil society, and so forth. In a sense, it, it brings us back to what Marius has raised and yourself also, right? It's citizen action, local communities. You know, if, if schools are at the center of a community, then schools would be a logical place where you would actually have food program and so forth. Scott, we have to begin to wind down the conversation. Um, so I'd like to ask you as, uh, you know, to, to, to bring the conversation together, um, from, from, from all three of you, um, we have themes that have come through the conversation, as I just indicated. Um, but if you would have to give us, you know, uh, a, a challenge, uh, what must we work at? And on the other side, what are the hopeful signs uh, that we see emerging and how people respond uh, to, to food security and helping one another uh, during the pandemic? Uh, so what must we get at? You know, if we say it's policy, sure, but what in the policy was me shift? And then what's the hopeful thing that, 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 that inspires you to continue with your work? Lorenzo, I'm going to ask you to start and then Marius and we ask Dula Sizwe for his final comments. Over to you. Uh, <clears throat> great, thank you. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to comment uh, and say that I think uh, the, trans, the transversal nature of, of, of cooperation is absolutely critical right now. Big government, small business, everybody into the room. Um, and, and it mustn't be a bureaucratic process. It must be a dynamic process. It must strip itself down to its bare knuckles and say, okay, here's the white sheet. Here's the blank paper. What do we want to see? Um, the second thing that I think is important is, is the value of small business in this ecosystem. In the food security ecosystem, small business is, the, is one of the greatest players. Not the big retailers. It's the small, it's the small, it's the small business, it's the SMME. And, and we, have, we have no idea. I mean, just take the taxi industry in, in, the, in the ecosystem. The taxi industry is more than an 11 billion rand industry in this country. It, it's, an, it's a massive economy. They, they, they ship thousands of tons of foods to townships. There, there is a story there. There is a system there. How do, we, how do we maximize that system? How do we take the guys who are selling multiple products along our route from our offices to our homes, how do we empower them to be more than just the odd fruit seller at the robot or uh, the guy who gives you uh, something that you, you want on the side of the road? It's, 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 it's taking um, those, those small businesses and recognize their role in the formal economy as a major contributor to our own ultimate food security. And, and I think that's why I want to say 
uh, what Rizbeth Kanter said, it's this notion of people who, who can lead um, without the hierarchies, um, but, but, but they sustain our economy. Uh, right now, I, I fear for them because uh, they've been out of business. They've been shut down uh, since the 26th of March. Um, uh, a significant number of people are employed in that SME industry. M millions of them are without salaries, completely without income. And the effects of that, as economists will know, it's gonna, it's gonna ripple over the next three to four months. We're gonna feel the effect of that. Um, and, and that effect can go either way. It can go up, up into a positive expression of new solidarity to create new systems, or it can go south downwards into negative violence, uh, robbery, and, and danger for our society as a whole. If, if we don't pay attention to taking this COVID moment and creating the system we are talking about here, it will be a missed moment. All of us in this room will talk about this conversation to our grandchildren one day, and we will have no evidence that the transversal food security ecosystem emerged from anything. And that would be a great tragedy. Thank you, Lorenzo. Marius? Well, I think on the positive side, the one thing that inspires me and always surprises me is that South Africans, you know, when the going gets tough, we get in there and we do something to fix the problem. And we've seen this, you know, in the Western Cape and Gauteng and other provinces, literally hundreds of South Africans giving of their time, giving of their resources, getting together, joining hands to make a plan. And that is true to our culture. You know, I don't know if South Africa has a single sort of shared culture, but I know that that ability to pull together when things are tough is definitely part of that shared culture. And that is quite inspiring. The one concern I have that I think we need to work on as South Africans is, you know, when the, when the lockdown started, we had this panic buying that we all saw, you know, the cues of people buying under, under, under stress. The other thing we do as South Africans is we have panic innovation. We wait until we're right at the edge of a cliff, ready to go over the edge of the cliff. And then we innovate our way and we talk our way and dialogue our way out of that crisis. And if we can find a way, instead of waiting till there's a global pandemic to fix the issue of food security or of poverty and inequality, if we can take a step back and say, what are the innovations we need to make that are going to set the country on a better path for the next 20, 30, 50 years? That's what we need to do. And that's going to mean that the same people who are now very quickly, hurriedly trying to fix food parcels for people, those are the people that have to make the, the plans and the strategies to set the country in a better path. And I hope, maybe similar to what Lorenzo says, I hope we can use the energy of this crisis to put ourselves in the right direction and maybe build a bit of capability to say, let's not wait until we're at the end of the cliff. Let's take responsibility as citizens for the direction that the country goes in. Thank you, Marius. To Lassizwe. Yeah, I would like to, to let you know what Marius, Marius was saying and actually say that the pandemic the COVID-19 pandemic presents us with liminal spaces or transitional spaces as a society where we need to be actually be using this opportunity to think that post-COVID-19, what society are we going to look at, especially in terms of the economy? That, that, that I'll speak from that, that, that perspective. To say that instead of mourning the lost opportunity, we should be using this time to say that never again should we be caught off, um, should, should we be caught unaware of such situations, the economy should develop in a way that it takes everybody with it as, as we go forward, whether it's a small business, uh, small business or a mega business that goes to, um, that, 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 that is even trans, trans, uh, that is multinational. We need to be working out a system of, of, of the economy that makes sure that even the person that is in a spaza shop, they realize how important they are to the economy and they have their own their own support structures, it were, and become resilient to actually deal with situations like this. Because if we rely, going back to my earlier point, if we rely on imported input, inputs in what we, we actually produce and sell, we, we are then dead in the water when a crisis like this comes and we, we have to shut our borders, we have to close everything, and then we, we are unable to, to innovate and go forward. South Africa should be an innovating society and we have the intellectual capabilities to innovate. But we need to start as a society um, rewarding innovation more than we're actually doing, instead of just people that 
copy and paste and, and, and carry on reproducing things that have already been done before. So in closing, I would like to say that this may be is a crisis, but there's a silver lining at the end of at the end of it all that says, if we pull through this, we need to be a stronger society and actually work more together in building a better South Africa for all of us. And I like the notions that the colleagues in the panel are actually are actually supporting that we should not be relying on a, on a strong government or strong individuals, or political affiliations, but it has to come from the ground from all of us to say that how do we actually make the society better? Countries that have actually developed are countries that are not hierarchical in, in terms of their approach, but they are more scientific and more solution oriented in what they do and, and develop so that they move forward as a country and as a society. So for me, it's, it's really a, clar a clarion call to say that we need to be rising from the, from the bottom and actually making sure that we are all resilient, even at the household level to say, what is it that I can do when a crisis comes? And we need to be planning the policies that we are creating at a government level, because the role of government is not to do or to produce, but is to create an, an, an enabling environment for businesses and for people to actually strive and become better, uh, better citizens. Thank you very much, Lucius. And colleagues, uh, so we've come to the end of the conversation. I must just uh, really thank you for your contributions and, and, uh, and sort of leading us in the, in the conversation. Uh, for me, it was it was uh, it was good to 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 be reminded of the distinctions between uh, food relief and food security. It's an important one. We need relief, but we're actually working to build food security. You know, and the notion that, in actual fact, uh, much of what we need to facilitate uh, security, bring it to the center of our societal engagement. Um, are already present uh, in our local communities and mothers that make plans for the kids to eat. Um, so in a sense, optimizing uh, uh, hidden solidarities that we find, um, uh, the references that we've made to, to, to policy shifts, you know, that many of those changes already are captured in how people live in, on, community, on community level and how to translate that, um, those solutions to the central. So colleagues, thank you very much. I found it really an an uh, encouraging and, and enlightening conversation. So, um, and uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Marius Oosthuizen, we wish you well with your doctoral work. We still, we, as far as I know, you're continuing with that work and we wish you well with that. Uh, 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 Dr. Tulasizwe Mkabela, we wish you well with the senior leadership role that you have uh, at a core agency in our country to work on, on, on the field, you know, in the research space, in designing and putting down policy for how we proceed. It's a big, it's a, it's a big ask and, and, and we wish you well with that work. And of course, Mr. Lorenzo Davids at Unity Chest, uh, thank you for leading in, in, a, in a very, in a very uh, uh, inspirational and, and, and practical way um, by getting your hands uh, uh, next to the food parcel and bringing the relief but doing so in a way that reflects on, on generations that stand in the line. We really appreciate that. So uh, colleagues, we respect you. We, we celebrate your contributions and thank you very much for participating. Please stay on the line until we, until we close the session. So just, just hang in there. Um, just a few technical comments for, for everyone in the audience. I think it's important to say, uh, I checked with the organizers while we were busy that there was an actual fact, uh, a major attempt to, to, re to recruit a gender integrated panel, but we weren't able to secure uh, women voices for the panel. So just to, just to set the record straight. Uh, I also want to invite you, you'll see in the description of the dialogue, there's a link um, and uh, through which you can register to receive uh, notices of the next dialogues um, uh, taking place. Please use that, uh, connect with that. Um, and then the next, uh, the next dialogue also for the panel for your interest would be on the 4th of June. And then we actually asking the question with the internet um, uh, is a human right. And therefore we have an ethical concern, Marius, as a society uh, to actually have the fourth industrial revolution mean something uh, for, for the farmer's daughter uh, in the most rural parts of the country, uh, if I may use that, uh, that, that image. Um, so that'll be on the 4th of June and we really invite you to participate and, and really appreciate uh, the, the... To close, I, uh, I would like to encourage you as our panel members do to leave your house, 
and support uh, our communities. Uh, reach out and build, build solidarities. And when you do that, let's see how it goes. Wear your mask. <laughs> Thank you very much for participating. Well, done. Wish you well and uh, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you to you, Rudy. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you.